our second reading comes to us in that same book we were just in, the book of Jonah. So what we've been doing is we've been working through this entire book over the last three, two weeks, and then this week is our third week. And so buckle up because we're going to do two chapters in one sermon. So uh, we're going to go really fast, but let's hear the word of God first. Uh, again, from Jonah, the fourth chapter, and this concludes the entire story that we've been re- working through. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, the fact that Nineveh had been saved, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? This is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now... O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. And he sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give him shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about this bush. But when dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you were concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and it perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city? in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hands from their left, and also many animals. May God add God's blessing to the reading, to the hearing, and to the understanding of God's holy word. Amen. All right, so the previous two weeks, here's what we've learned. The last week, first week was the first chapter of Jonah, that storms save us, that storms are oftentimes things, tools, instruments that God used to save us, saved Jonah. And then secondly, as Jonah prayed in the belly of that fish, it was one of thanksgiving and one of repentance and allowed for it to turn. So in times of trouble, rather than rage, maybe we should offer thanksgiving. This week, I'm not sure what we're going to learn, but I do know this. This story ends not like we think it should, mainly because this story just ended with a question. Did you understand that? Did you get that? I tried to to make that my tone. But the last words of Jonah say, and also many animals. Are you kidding me? Question mark. Like I'm, I, the first time I read through it, I was like, wait a second, my, my paper got ripped out because this is not how this ends. But God asks the questions about cows. That's actually how the King James Version translates it. And many cows. This doesn't end like you think it should. So let's back up just a moment. Let's go back to talk about Assyria a little bit. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. It's a hard word to say, Hope. <laughs> Nineveh. Hope did a great thing because she just said, I know, she's, but she, I, 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 teach, I teach, this is what I teach people when they read. If you don't know how to pronounce something, just say it with a lot of conviction. Nobody's ever going to know the difference. And then I get up and have to say it 19 times, and sorry. Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. Assyria was a big, bad, massive empire. The nastiest of the nasty. I mean, brutality all over the place. And if they didn't kill you when they conquered you, they made you suffer through torture. These were some very, very bad, bad dudes. They were crafty also in the way in which 
they would destroy countries. So they would go in and they would invade other nations and they would intermingle with these smaller nations, these smaller empires, these smaller groups, and then they would produce children with them by intermingling and, and systematically they would literally water down the gene pool to eliminate these people. In fact, one of these groups you've heard of, the Samaritans, part Assyrian, and part Jews. And we know that story that Jesus tells that caused so much trouble in the people who were listening to it because how could a Samaritan be good? See, this is what Assyria was up to. This is what the, the Ninevites were trying to do. So, so you can imagine that Jonah doesn't want to go to see these people. He runs away from a call one time. And even as he is spat out or vomited out, as the King James says, from the fish onto dry land, he goes reluctantly to Nineveh. We're told in the text that it's a three days journey across the city. So across this, it would take three days to walk. The average person back then used to walk about 20 miles a day. So we're thinking somewhere around the range of about 60 miles across. I got no reference on that. I have no idea what to tell you that's like. But it's a long way. So 60 days across, Jonah goes reluctantly. We know he goes reluctantly because he doesn't even go into the heart of the city. He goes a day's journey. So he's literally probably about half a day's journey from the center of the city. He's on the outskirts. Probably, let's just say, if he were called to go to Charleston, he'd hit right here and he'd stop. Now how effective would, us be to, would it be for us to prophesy to Charleston, to downtown Charleston from out here? Not very much. He didn't want to go. He didn't want them to be saved. Friends, check this. Because listen, what does he say to them? You're going to be judged, Nineveh. You're going to be judged. Not words of hope. Not words of, hey, you might want to change your ways. Not words of, God can save you. Instead, he just simply said, you're going to get it. Has that ever been an effective way of spreading God's Word? Has anybody ever, you think, maybe somebody, but has anybody ever really responded to somebody with a bullhorn on a street corner yelling at you? No. I don't think so. Not in the way in which God would have it to do. Maybe some people. He didn't want to go. And he's not offering a good word. But God's still working. Check this. God, upon seeing the repentant hearts of the Ninevites, changed God's mind. Did you pick up on that when Hope read that to you? That God's mind changed. Those aren't my words. Don't get mad at the preacher. That's what the Bible says. Because we like to, to tout God as being this all-knowing, all-never-changing kind of creature. Absolutely God is that way. But the text just told us God changed His mind. So what do we do with that? I'm not questioning it. God changed God's mind. That's God doing God's thing. That's not for me to judge. God changed God's... God's going to do God's thing and we have to do ours, friends. That's the point of the whole relationship that we have. There's part that God's going to do and there's part that we're going to do. And at some point in time, we've got to let go and say God's going to do God's thing as long as I do my part. And even when I don't do my part, God's still going to do God's thing. Even when I mess up royally. And he did. We know that. Jonah, Jonah was a royal mess up. I, maybe that's why I like him so much. is because Jonah messed up time and time and time again. And God's word, God's will, God's way still got accomplished. If that's not freeing and releasing to you, I don't know what else I can offer you this morning. Because for me, that just makes me be able to breathe a sigh of relief that if God's going to use some knucklehead like Jonah, that maybe God can use a knucklehead like Brad. Now, that's me. Or maybe some of you. Not you, Brad. That was terrible about me. But Jonah is still angry. I, and maybe I know just too many people who are like Jonah. Jonah's still angry. He's just got it burning up inside him. And he says, I knew. I 
knew this was going to happen, God. I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And does that sound like the Old Testament God we're used to talking about? Have you thought about that? We, like to, I mean, we really like to differentiate between the, the Old Testament God who's full of power and might and, and going to bring the hammer. And then we look at the New Testament God and we see Jesus all loving and passive like the, with the, the carrying the, the shepherd on his, I mean the, uh, the sheep on the shoulder like the good shepherd. We, we differentiate between, but here we're reading that that is the same God. It's active in the Old Testament it is in the New Testament. Slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You see, Jonah was so focused on being right that he missed what was going on. He missed the bigger picture. Let me say that again because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb and say that we struggle with this. Not all of us, but, but some of us struggle with this. We miss the bigger picture because we are so focused on being right. We're so focused on being the one that's proven right that we miss the bigger picture. Can you, can you, can you think of how this would work in your life? Do you see this? That, that we get into arguments sometimes with people and we are so adamant that our way is the right way and the only way and we just force ourselves upon other people and we're missing the bigger picture. I see this in, in relationships that I have. Jonah was missing the bigger picture, friends. It was the, much more was going on than what Jonah was, was focusing on. So filled with anger. And then we get this amazing story. It was, it was as if the story was done and the writer wants to, to sort of just hammer the point home. He just pulls out a mallet and starts whacking away even harder. And he says, I'm going to write this story about, about Jonah and the, the shrub or the bush. I think one translation even calls it the gourd. The gourd of the Lord. <laughs> that grows up. Providing shade for Jonah. And then it withers, and then it dies, and that even inflames him even more. As a bald man, I know that when the sun's beating down on my head, it hurts bad. I don't know if Jonah was bald or not, but it hurts when that sun beats down on you, right? Yeah, it hurts. Get angry even more. It just wells up inside him some more. And I think Jonah hits on a part of our our American Christian belief system that, that hurts a little bit. Because we like to think that we should get what we deserve. That, actually, hang on, let me change that. The better statement is that we tend to believe more that we should get what we earn and other people should get what they deserve. <laughs> like that? We get what we earn and other people get what they, they deserve. <laughs> I've been driving down the road on a highway on an interstate and have somebody go 90 miles an hour by, beside you and pass you like you're standing still. What's the first thought that pops into your mind? Be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they get pulled over. Where's the police when you need them? Don't you think that? They need to get what they deserve. Or the mentality says this, God helps those who help themselves. That's not in the Bible, friends. Let me dispel that myth right there. That is not in the Bible. God helps those who helps themselves is not in... Th that is a trite cliche, and I want to dispel that from your memory ever. You see, we believe that if we work hard enough, if we do the right things that we've, we've earned 
our lot in life. And, and the, the danger of this is we fall into the trap of believing we can earn God's love. If we just do a little bit more, then God's love and light will shine upon us. And friends, this is, this is the way we operate to make ourselves comfortable. Because we want the world to work in a way in which we can predict. We want the world to work in a way in which we can understand it with our minds so that we can go focus on other things and we don't have to worry about bad things happening to good people. Right? I mean, this is the struggle that we have or, or, or good things happening to, 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 to bad people. It's like it doesn't make sense. We want it to work in a very structured, formal way for us to be comfortable. And unfortunately, that's not the way God works. Instead, here, here, let me offer you this. This is Richard Rohr, uh, who is a writer that I love to read. He said, every time God forgives us, God is saying that God's own rules do not matter as much as the relationship that God wants to create with us. You know it's coming again because I, I always repeat things. Every time God forgives us, God is saying that God's own rules do not matter as much as the relationship that God wants to create with us. Now don't hear that wrong because I'm not saying rules don't matter. Rules protect us from ourselves. Okay? Not from an angry God, but from ourselves. From the harm that we would do ourselves. Quick story. I believe I was eight. You may not remember this. My sister is up here. You remember about five. Here's, here's a story about rules that apply. Anybody ever take a penny and stick it in a light socket? <laughs> <laughs> There's rules. The rules of electricity? I don't know what you would call it. Eight years old. Right? And I'm going to... My parents have told me, Brad, you don't do that. Again, I'm, I'm a little thick in the head. Don't do that. That was their rule. Don't stick a penny in the light socket. I did. You remember that? No. Stuck it in the light socket. Loud pop, black fingers, black light socket, little hair. I had hair back then. Stood up a little bit. <laughs> Mom comes running in. What'd you do? She didn't have to ask that question, did she? I've been sitting there going. <laughs> and she loved me. Provided me some care. Cleaned me up. Calmed me down. She didn't have to be mad at me that I had, had broken let me know that I'd messed up. <laughs> right? <laughs> Friends, God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. Right? That whosoever comes to Him shall not perish but have eternal life. There's another part to that. The next very words are things we have to remember. God did not send His Son to condemn the world, but rather that the world would be saved through Him. God didn't send His Son into the world to condemn the world, and He didn't send you either to condemn the world. Are you tracking with that? He sent the Son and now the church to redeem the world to offer salvation. This is our task just as much as it was the task for Jonah. And sometimes we are so stubborn like him. We look at the world and we say, God, forget it all. But we're called to preach the good news. So what do we do if they reject us? Because that's the fear, right? I mean, that's the fear that we operate under sometimes is that if we actually share our faith in our life that we're going to be rejected. Do we seek to pass laws to force it? 
Do we seek to, to force our will upon others? Because I think we've already established the fact that coercion never really works. Or instead, do we open up our arms as Christ did on the cross and maybe offer a prayer that goes something like this? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then we trust. We trust that God is going to do God's thing. Because if He did it through Jonah, He can do it through us. And if He did it for the Ninevites, God knows He'll do it for us in this land. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.